Hello everyone, my name is Oscar Moreno and I'm a registered nurse here in the El Paso community. Today I have been asked to present to you all in this video a common chronic respiratory disease called asthma. Asthma has been estimated as of 2010 to affect 25 million Americans. Out of those 25 million, 7 million have been identified to be less than 18 years of age. Asthma affects people of all ages. It does not discriminate, but it has been identified that symptoms commonly present during childhood, thus why I present at your high school today. So in order for us to better understand what we're going to be talking about today, we must first understand, what is asthma? Asthma is a syndrome that's been characterized by obstruction of airflow in and out of the lungs. In the case of asthma, this obstruction is caused by inflammation or swelling of the airway tubes, in addition to increased production of mucus in the airway, which is triggered by an immune response due to an irritant or an allergen in those airways. Those airway tubes are more commonly and accurately referred to as bronchioles. When these bronchioles become inflamed, it makes it harder for oxygen to move in and out of the lungs. Think of it as attempting to breathe through a straw. It would be harder to breathe, wouldn't it? So when these bronchioles become obstructed, we see some of the more common signs and symptoms of asthma due to the swelling of the bronchioles. These symptoms include shortness of breath, tightness of the chest, coughing, and wheezing, which is a whistling breathing sound. So now that we know what asthma is and the symptoms, we must now ask ourselves, what are the risk factors to developing asthma and what exactly causes asthma? There are various factors that may influence the development of asthma. These, there is factors that we can't control and factors that we may control, which may interact and result in the development of asthma. So let's present these two major factors as two major points. Genetic factors, and environmental factors. There is two major genetic factors I would like to discuss with you today. The first one is the concept of atopy, which is a genetic predisposition to an allergic reaction caused by an allergen and is the most common cause of asthma. Some of the most common allergens at, that result in the development of asthma are pollen, animal fur, and dust mites. In addition, gen ge gender presents to be a big influence in the developing of asthma. It has been found that males are twice as likely to develop asthma than females in their childhood. Ah! Now I would like to take the time to talk to you all about, about environmental factors which can cause irritation of the lungs Inflammation ultimately cause asthma and exacerbation. Some of these factors you may control and others are a little bit harder to control, but you could try. There's indoor allergens, which include dust mites and animal fur. There's outdoor allergens, which could include pollen and air pollutants, such as diesel particles. And then there's also occupational uh, allergens uh, or sensitizers, which are basically workplace allergens, um, which can cause irritation of the airways. This can relate to those of you that are probably in sports or work outside of school. Uh, in reference to sports, uh, you know, some of the you guys that work out in, uh, in, in, our, in sports, uh, you guys might come in contact with grass pollen or the chalk powder, which is used to line the, the lines in the playing field. Those could be risk factors and cause you to develop uh, an asthma attack. For those of you that work outside of school, uh, working at places such as Pizza Hut or Starbucks might become uh, a risk factor to you coming in contact with these allergens. Uh, things such as wheat germ or wheat powder or maybe even the ground coffee bean, those can cause irritation of your lungs if inhaled and cause an exacerbation of asthma. Smoking, both first-hand and second-hand, can cause irritation of the lungs and are a major risk factor uh, to the development of asthma and the exacerbation of asthma symptoms. In addition, respiratory infections, such as a common cold, uh, can cause the development and the result of asthma production. In addition, diet has been found to have a major risk factor in the development of asthma. 
Diets that are low in antioxidants such as vitamin A, C, D, magnesium, psyllium, and omega-3, and diets high in omega-6 have been found to be contributing risk factors to the development of asthma. In addition, it's important to note that obesity has now become an independent risk factor to the development of asthma. So a diet that is high in fruits and vegetables and low in fats is advised. For those of you that already suffer from asthma, on top of these risk factors, it's important for you to know what your trigger responses are or your triggers. These triggers may include allergens such as plants, animal furs, or dust mites, upper respiratory infections, so be very cautious during cold seasons, exercise and hyperventilation, so when you exercise during sports, be very cautious, cold air, stress, and household aerosol sprays such as air fresheners or even hairspray. Whatever your trigger is, it's important to identify what your trigger are in order for you to prevent any asthma exacerbations. Now that we know what asthma is and what causes asthma, it's important for us to now discuss the treatment options for asthma. The main aim to treating asthma is reducing the inflammation of the airway. Bronchodilators, which provide rapid relief, and controllers, which provide long-term treatment, are the most common types of drugs used. The most common and effective bronchodilator treatment is the beta-2 agonist. These medications come in both short-acting or fast-acting. Uh, they're most commonly referred to as rescue inhalers and long-acting inhalant treatments. These could come in either an inhaler or a nebulizer treatment, which is a little mask that pulls in smoke uh, to help the medication go into your lungs. The medications work by relaxing the smooth muscles around your airways, but do not treat the underlying inflammatory response. So these medications should not be used for long-term treatment. In particular, short-term agonists such as uh, albuterol should only be used when severe development of symptoms occur. Okay, because if used routinely, these medications could actually worsen asthma and ultimately can cause death. There's other bronchodilator treatments that are used less frequently, such as anticholinergics, uh, which are less commonly used due to the fact that they're less effective. Now I'm going to take the time to discuss with you the most common medication used to control asthma symptoms, which is an inhaled corticosteroid. What this medication does, it's not only the most effective treatment, but it helps reduce the inflammatory response to an asthma attack, thus reducing the swelling in the lungs and making it easier for the person with the asthma to breathe. So this medication should be used for long-term effects, unlike the bronchodilators that only work on the muscles around the, the airway instead of actually treating the inflammatory response itself. This is the main reason why this medication has been used as the first-line treatment for asthma. There's other medications such as oral, intravenous, and intramuscular corticosteroid treatments, but due to their fact that they're not as effective or they have actually very adverse effects, very bad effects, uh, side effects to them, they're not very uh, commonly used. And there's also other medications such as steroid sparing therapy, such as immunosuppressants, but due to the lack of effectiveness, um, they're also not as commonly used. These medications are only used in very severe and extreme cases when maybe the corticosteroid inhalant does not work as effective by itself, or the patient probably has a lot of side effects to that medication. So the use of inhaled corticosteroids and beta-2 agonists has been found to be the most effective and is usually the first line of treatment for asthma patients. Your medication treatment could be evaluated through various ways. First, assess your symptoms. Are they getting better or worse? Are you finding yourself having to use your rescue inhaler more often? Uh, if you're finding yourself using your rescue inhaler 
more than two days in a week, it's something that you might want to look into. Call your healthcare provider and ask them what other options you might have. Maybe there might need to be adjustments to your long-term inhaler treatment. In addition, your healthcare provider may assess your peak expiratory flow, which is a measurement of your ability to blow out. The use of a device called a spirometer, uh, which is a funnel you blow into, will be calculating this measurement. Although it has been found that symptoms peak around three years of age and that usually the symptoms subside during adolescent years, symptoms may return during adult life. Thus, preventative measures are very important to follow. The biggest thing here is to remain compliant with your medication regimen. Make sure to use those inhalers, especially your long-term inhalers. I know sometimes it might be difficult to comply with them because you don't feel the relief as quickly as the short-term inhalers uh, or the beta agonists, but it's very important to follow your regimen in order to prevent an asthmatic attack in the future. In addition, avoid upper respiratory infections. So always make sure to wash your hands, especially during cold season, to prevent acquiring a bacterial or even a viral infection. Uh, the vaccination of the flu is a, a very, very, very effective way to prevent upper respiratory infections. In addition, try to avoid your triggers. As mentioned before, you might have various triggers. Identifying what those triggers are is a key way of preventing uh, exposure in the future. There's undergoing, undergoing a skin prick test uh, or allergy test where you're pricked with different allergies on your skin, which may help you identify what those triggers are. If you know what causes your triggers, you are able to easily avoid those triggers and prevent an asthmatic attack. In addition, don't smoke. And if you do smoke, stop smoking, please. You shouldn't be smoking. It's a very bad thing to do. Uh, it really affects your respiratory system. And in this case, it could really cause uh, an asthma attack to present itself. So prevention uh, and, and cessation of smoking is the key. In addition, uh, during days that are very dusty or very cold, uh, I would encourage you guys to use a mask or a scarf uh, over your mouth and your nose in order to prevent any dust or cold air getting inside your lungs. Remember that cold air can cause irritation of your skin as well inside the lining of your lungs and can cause an exacerbation of asthma. In addition to dust, usually when there's a lot of wind out there, outside, dust or pollen can be easily picked up. Get into those airways and make it uh, harder for you to breathe if an allergic reaction does present. So very important to always cover your mouth. So today we have gone over a lot of information in reference to asthma. I know it's a lot to take in, but it's very crucial information. There is so much to know and so much to yet be discovered in reference to asthma. And it is through your bright minds that we hope to share this information and encourage you to look up more information and hopefully you could discover more information and discover the cure to this chronic health condition. I really want to thank you for taking the time to uh, listening to my video. Uh, if you have any questions, concerns, comments, anything at all, please let me know. Uh, I am more than happy to answer any questions and I am more than happy to take any comments or suggestions in order to improve this presentation. Once again, thank you for your time and I hope to uh, come back once again uh, or write, make another video in order to uh, talk to you more about asthma or other health conditions that you might have questions about. Thank you.